In this first message in this series, we understand that God is very interested in our lives, very interested in the steps we take, the path we choose, and the decisions we make. We learn that we can know God's will accurately. We discover how God guides us through his written word. All right, why don't we rise up to our feet, please? Let's make our declaration. And then we're going to spend some time in God's words. So, if you brought your Bible, or high up in the air, let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. I advance boldly to take new ground to extend God's kingdom. I have kingdom power and authority vested in me. The powers of darkness cannot hold me back or pin me down. The forces of the enemy cannot restrain me or contain me. The greater one is in me. God's power through me is more than what the devil can handle. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to people next to you? Say hello, shake hands, give them a good smile, and you may be seated. Starting today, over the next uh, six to eight weeks, we're going to be talking about receiving God's guidance. How does God guide us? How does God lead us? You know, all of us have decisions to make in life. Some decisions may be really small. Should you eat chapati or dosa? That's okay. Just close your eyes and do what you want. <laughs> uh, but then there are some decisions that are really big, some really major decisions in life. And as students, you may decide, you know, uh, what should I study further? You know, uh, the, the, you know, in the good old days, we had only three options. You know? <laughs> but today, you probably have 30 options or more. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it, the more options, the more difficult the decision becomes. What do I choose in life? You know, or, or once you finish studying, where, what profession do you, what career path do you take? Uh, you know, there's so many options again. And you can mix and match so many things these days. You've got the uh, opportunity, but also it becomes a challenge in, in making that decision. It becomes all the more difficult uh, to make a decision. Uh, and then there are other decisions, like, you know, uh, your life part person you're going to marry. Uh, you uh, spend, spend your life with. Uh, where you're going to live. Which part of the world do you want to live. Uh, the church you go to. And so, much, so on and so forth. The, uh, significant decisions, major decisions uh, we all have to make as we journey through life. And so uh, it's important for us to, you know, and I'm sure all of us want to uh, receive guidance from God. We desire that God, I want to do your will. I want to do what's right. What, what, are you, what are you telling me to do? So we all desire that. And so we are trying to address that and say, look, these are the different ways in which God speaks to us. So there is no formula. Now, we're not going to, there is no formula that the Bible offers us saying, here, this is your answer. But rather, we're going to look at, uh, I think, about 11 different ways that we see in the Bible. Uh, that God speaks, God releases His guidance into our lives. Uh, we will talk about these over the several weeks ahead. The Word, the indwelling Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Holy Spirit, dreams and visions. Prophecies, angels, godly counsel, the renewed mind, 
times and seasons, circumstances and divine orchestrations. All of these are ways through which God brings his guidance into our lives. Now, some of you may be familiar with these already. I mean, if you've been part of APC, uh, we've touched on some of these things uh, in times past. And you may be familiar. But I want to encourage you, please listen as though you've never heard this before. Or at least pretend that. <laughs> Please listen as though this is our first time you are listening to something on this, right? Otherwise, you tend to tune off, doze off, and then you wake up at the end and say, what did he say? Like, <laughs> and you might miss something important. So please pay attention even if you, know, if you are familiar uh, with some of these things. And I want to show you that uh, we will be going into greater depth uh, and breadth than we've ever done before uh, as we talk about some of these things. Uh, an, an important truth we want to emphasize as we go to this uh, uh, is that uh, both in the Old and the New Testament, uh, the, the Bible teaches us, 2 Corinthians 13, 1, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That means don't just take one of these areas. So I had a dream and then run away with it. Uh, let there be at least two or three witnesses. Let God speak to you in a multiplicity of any of these 11 ways, any combination. But let God speak to you uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So that's a word of caution. Otherwise, sometimes people say, you know, I had a dream and so I'm going off to do this. Well, it's good you had a dream, but that's one witness. You need Two or three more, you know, wait for God. Uh, be clear, especially when it comes to uh, major decisions uh, that, uh, that you and I uh, have to make in life. Now, it is true that uh, all of us will make mistakes uh, in life's journey. There, are, uh, there is no one who is perfect. We will stumble. We will make mistakes. But I just want to assure us that our God is greater than our mistakes. Amen. This is not an encouragement to go make mistakes, <laughs> but this is only an encouragement if you make mistakes, right? That don't think it's the end of the world. God is able to fix uh, our own, uh, our mistakes. We just go back to him and say, God, I'm sorry, I, I missed it. Uh, please get me back on track. He'll put us back on track. He'll restore uh, what we've uh, lost and he will help us on in our journey. Another thing I want to mention also is uh, that through the course of this series, uh, uh, different ones of us will be talking. Uh, we will share some of our personal experiences. Now, uh, personal experiences are good. Uh, we can learn from them. We can be encouraged. But I want to please, I want to bring all of our attention to this important thing. Do not build your life on somebody else's experience. As a believer, you have to build your life on the word of God and the work of his spirit in your life life. So don't run off saying, oh, I heard pastor say this, I'm also going to do the same thing. Some things are very risky, right? So don't build your life on my experience or the experience of others who will be speaking to us. Uh, please uh, learn from those experiences, but go back and build your life on the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. So the wonderful thing is that uh, in as much as we desire to receive God's guidance for our lives and, and, and understand his will, the beautiful thing is that God has promised to lead and guide us. So I want to begin with that. To give us the assurance that God has promised to lead and to guide us. Let me look at a few scriptures on that. Uh, in Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24, uh, the Bible says, let's read it together please. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, don't think the Bible is prejudiced. When it says good man, it also includes women, right? <laughs> so the steps of a good person, good person, are ordered. Very interesting word. It means that God sets in place. He erects. He establishes. He makes firm. The steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. So let's say this. God delights in my way. You know, some of us think, man, God is so big. He's got such a big universe. Why would he even be worried about me? 
And why bother about little old me? I, I'm so insignificant. But I want to show you, the Bible says, and as the Amplified Bible renders that section of that verse, it says, he busies himself with your every step. He busies him. He's, he's very interested in every step of your life, of my life. So God delights. He's busy, really engaged in, in our decisions, in the things that involve our life. And the next verse 24 gives us that assurance that even if we stumble and fall, it's not the end of the world. It's, uh, it's not the end of everything because even if we stumble, God upholds us. He grasps us and he holds us up uh, with his own strong, powerful right hand. So God is able to keep us uh, back on, bring us back on track and keep us going. Psalm 32, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, let's read it together please. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule. Which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Look at verse 8. Beautiful. God says, I will instruct you, I will teach you, I will guide you. So let's say this together. God has promised to instruct me, to teach me, to guide me. No, he said, I'll do it with my eye, meaning my watchful eye is on you. Got my eye on you. I, God doesn't slumber nor sleep. It's like his, his eye is on you. And he says, I will instruct you. I will teach you. I will guide you. And it's interesting. You look at those verses in, 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 the, in the Hebrew. and just, Because he, it just brings out much more meaning. The word instruct means to make you circumspect, intelligent, prudent, and wise. And give you the skill so that you can have good success. So when God says, I will instruct you, that's what he's meaning. He's saying, I will make you circumspect. I will make you prudent. I will give you the skill so that you can be successful. I will instruct you. The word teach, again, is very interesting in the Hebrew. It means to point a finger to. So when he says, I will teach you. He said, I will point the finger to you, for you. And it's, it has a picture in it of a, a man shooting an arrow, the bow and arrow, man shooting it. Meaning, with, that tar with a target in mind, I will point my finger to you, for you. I will teach you. I will instruct you. I will teach you. And I will guide you. To guide there, of course, means to advise and counsel. So God has promised to do that for us. But on the other hand, he's asking us for a response. In verse 9, he says, but don't be like the horse or like the mule. That run ahead or they are so stubborn they don't want to move. Don't take either of these postures. God says, instead I want you to work with me. As I promise to instruct you, teach you, guide you. Let's do this together. Are you with me? So God has promised that for us. And one more verse here on this, Psalm 25, verse 12. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Let's read it together, please. Let's start again. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. I want to highlight that word fear, reverence. I like how the Good News Bible renders this verse. It says, those who have reverence for the Lord will learn from him the path they should Reverence for the Lord is important because God knows that when he speaks to us, we will obey. And we will take his instructions seriously. That our heart is in the right place. We really want to do what God wants for our lives. And so God is saying, for those of you who reverence me, I will teach you the way you should go. The way you should choose. Now, as we begin, and this is still the introduction, as we begin, I want to cover some basics as far as understanding the will of God is concerned. We need to get some of these basics in place. The number one, and there are five of these, number one, God's will is always consistent with his nature. Now I've mentioned these before, I'm repeating it again. God's will is always consistent with his nature. 
That means God is not going to lead you, direct you, or direct me to do something that contradicts his own nature. For example, we know God is a holy God. So God cannot direct you or guide you or guide me to do something that's unholy. Because it contradicts his nature. So God will not, so God's will is always consistent with his nature. The second basic we should have in place is that God's will is always consistent with his words. God will not guide you or direct you and me in a way that contradicts his word. The Holy Spirit who inspired the word will always guide us in line with the word he inspired. We understand that? So he will never contradict his word. God's will is always consistent with his word. And that's important. If somebody comes and says, you know, God told me to do this and that. And, uh, and then uh, you say, well, hey, that just contradicts, ex contradicts what's already in the Bible. Then whatever, you, that, whatever this and that you got, you don't know where you got it from. But it cannot be from the God who wrote the Bible. Now, God may contradict our understanding of the Bible if our understanding of the Bible is wrong. That's a different matter. But he will never contradict his words. And we see examples in the Bible and scripture too when people's understanding of the Bible was not really up to the mark and God had to adjust their understanding of the scriptures. I'll take for example, keeping of the Sabbath. You know, the Old Testament, they kept the Sabbath so rigidly, you cannot do anything on Sabbath. And here comes Jesus on the Sabbath, these healing people, his disciples are, you know, uh, picking grain and they're offended. So how come you're doing that? He says, well, Sabbath was given for man, not man for the, I need to adjust your understanding. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus had to do that. Or think about the early church. He said, go to the whole world, preach the gospel to every creature. But they were only staying in Jerusalem. So he gives Peter this vision. And he says, Peter, arise and eat. And he says, all kinds of creeping things, all kinds of animals. And Peter says, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. But God's telling him to eat the unclean. But through that, he's saying, please go take the gospel to the Gentiles. So he's, he's adjusting his understanding of of God and of his word. So God may adjust and understand the word, but he will never contradict his word. Number three, God's promises are a revelation of God's will. So the promise of God is also an expression of the will of God. God would not have promised it to us if he never willed for us to have it. So keep that in mind. If there's a promise of God, it means that God's will uh, is there for you concerning that. Number four, God desires for us to know his will. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this. That God is more than ready to reveal his will to us. You know, some of us are like this. You meet them and say, what are you doing? I am seeking God's will. That's good. 25 years later. <laughs> what are you doing? I am seeking God's will. Now, that's a little problem. That God's will is not so difficult to find. It's been lost somewhere in this vast expanse of this universe. No. I want us to understand God desires for us to know his will. And in fact, he has made it easy for us to know his will. And we should understand that. We should be confident of that. I will look at two scripture passages, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and then from Ephesians 5. Colossians 1, 9 and 10, Paul is praying for the believers at Colossae. He says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that, let's read the rest of the verse together, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding let's read verse 10 that you may walk worthy of the lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god so what is paul praying for the believers he's saying i'm praying this for you 
that you will be filled. Filled means to be full up, nothing lacking. See, as a believer, you do not have to lack. You do not have to fall short of knowing the will of God. You can pray that you be filled with the knowledge of his will. The other thing I want to highlight is the word knowledge in, in Greek, epignosis, which means to, be ha to have a full and complete, deep and clear knowledge of his will. So he's saying, I'm praying that you will be filled with a full, complete, deep, clear, accurate, precise knowledge of his will. It's a good prayer to pray for somebody else. And it's a good prayer to pray for you. So put your hand on your chest. Let's pray it for ourselves. I pray that I be filled with a full, complete, precise accurate clear knowledge of his will in jesus name amen pray that for yourself we all need to do that because we all have decisions to make from time to time we need uh, god to reveal that to us so uh, be assured that you can be filled with the knowledge with a clear precise deep accurate knowledge of god's will for your life and here's the, and the ne next thing is this. It says, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So it takes wisdom and spiritual understanding to know his will. Wisdom and understanding given to us by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about this next Sunday. But that helps us know his will. The wisdom and understanding comes coming from the Holy Spirit. And what will be the outcome? When you and I know his will, there are four results. Verse 10. We will walk worthy of the Lord. That means we'll walk in a way that honors God. Second, we will be fully pleasing to Him. Third, we will be fruitful in every good work. And fourth, we will increase in the knowledge of God. See, when you know His will, you can walk in a way that honors Him. You can be pleasing to Him. Be fruitful and keep growing. But the converse is also true. When you and I don't know his will, it is very likely we may do things that dishonor him. We may do things that don't please him. And we may not bear fruit. You're doing stuff, doing stuff, but no fruit. Nothing's happening. And we become stagnant in our knowledge of the Lord. Are you understanding? So it's very important to know the will of God. And we can. Let's go to Ephesians 5, the other, the other passage we want to look at under point number 4, which is Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 10 and verse 17. Let's read that together, please. Verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So he says, you are children of light. You walk bearing fruits of the Spirit, all goodness, and righteousness, and all of that. But then, as children of light, here's one thing you've got to pursue. Verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the so walk as children, of, as children of light, this is our responsibility. Find out what is acceptable to the Lord. That word finding out is very interesting. It means to test, examine, prove, discern, figure out. Test, examine, check it out, prove, figure out. So he says that's your responsibility. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now I want to... Just spend a little time on that word acceptable. In English, in our language, the word acceptable means average. Okay. It's not the same as perfect. Acceptable. Talega. Right? It's okay. But that's not what it means in the Greek. In the Greek, it means 
fully agreeable, well pleasing. I mean, there's no shortcoming. It's not like God says it's okay. I don't like it, but it's okay. It's not like that. God is saying, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm fully agreeable to this. It's well pleasing. Are you understanding? So he's saying in verse 10, finding out what is fully agreeable, well pleasing to God. That's what we want. Meaning hit the bullseye. Are you getting it? Acceptable means what is well pleasing, fully agreeable to God. Find out. And look at verse 17. It says, do not be unwise. Unwise. Again, it's a very interesting word. It means don't be without reason. I'm giving you the expanded meaning of that Greek word there. Without reason. Don't be senseless, foolish, stupid, without reflection or intelligence, acting rashly. Don't be unwise. But understand. Again, that word understand is very interesting. When you look, up, look it up in the Greek, it means to put together, to comprehend, to set or join together in the mind. To bring together in a hostile sense, bringing two combatants together. That means there could be ideas and things that are contrary, opposing each other, but you're putting it together in your mind. To bring together, comprehending, processing it in your mind. So don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now why am I emphasizing this verse? Because... Many times when, when, when believers, you know, want to seek the will of God, we tend to throw our brains out. So don't. You need your brains. Because he said, don't be unwise. But understand, which means you're going to put together in your mind. You've got to put together, even if they're contradicting opposing views, you bring them together, set them together, understand what the will of the Lord is. So many times we'll come for counsel or advice, and sometimes you just, get, look, they say, you know, they're, they're expecting some dream or angel. Look, we don't have angels in our pockets that they can give you. Can't do that. Now God may speak through a prophetic word and all that, there's a place for it. But sometimes we just have to give somebody some simple, common sense good practical counsel and they don't want it it's not spiritual hey don't be unwise but understand use your brains understand what the will of the lord is. we'll talk more about that when we come to that section when we talk about the renewed mind how what role the mind plays. I'm not saying we should depend on the mind. But the mind has a place. So don't throw it out. Amen. <laughs> Point five. In all of this. There will be things that remain unknown. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29. The Bible says the secret things belong to God. But those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. That we may do all the words, words of this law. So there will be, there's this realm of secrecy with God. There's a realm that God says, look, I'm keeping this to myself. And so there will be in life's journey, the unknown, the unexplained, the unanswered. And as believers, we can still be at peace with the unknown, with the unanswered, with the unexplainable. Because we have the peace that is beyond understanding. So even if you don't have an answer, it's okay. I'm still at peace. Because I know the secret things belong to God. My responsibility is to know His will for my life in this matter. Keep proceeding. I don't get hung up on what, I, what is unanswered, unexplained, or unknown. That belongs to God. Leave it there. There will always be this realm of the unknown. Now, we are still in the introduction. Another part, important thing I want to address in the introduction is, are there different categories of God's will? Now, 
I came from a denominational church. And so one of these first things I heard was this. That there are three kinds, three categories of God's will. There is what is the good. There is the perfect. And there is the permissive, acceptable will of God. The first time I heard it, I said there's something wrong with that. Now, I was still a teenage boy. I had not finished my English language in school. Neither had I studied theology. But just reading that verse and hearing somebody preach that message from that verse, I said something wrong. Can't be right. Basic English. And so I want to explain. I want us to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, because people use that to tell us that there are three categories, classifications to the will of God. Which I want to clearly state it's not. There is only one. And it is the will of God. If it's not the will of God, then it is not the will of God. Let me try it again. <laughs> if it is not the will of God, it means it is not the will of God. God is light. In him there is no darkness. That also means there is no gray area. He is light. So there is no gray area of permissive will of God. Now let me explain that. Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God. That you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy. What's the next word? I want to ask you a question. When he says your body should be holy, acceptable, this acceptable means chalega or does it mean equal to holy? Let's try it again. <laughs> does that word acceptable means something less than holy or does it mean the same as holy? Same as holy. Right? Present your body holy, acceptable means acceptable is the same standard as holy. And it is the same word that we saw back in Ephesians 5 verse 17 where it says acceptable means in the Greek well pleasing and fully agreeable. Not partly agreeable, fully agreeable. Present your body holy, well pleasing, fully acceptable to the Lord. Let nothing in your body be fall short of holiness. God, my little toe will sin, please excuse that. No. Your whole body should be holy. Why am I emphasizing that? Because that's the same word that's used in the next verse. Romans 12 verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove. That is you understand, you examine, you test, you analyze, you discern and you arrive at a conclusion. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So what they used to teach us was there are three classifications of the will of God. One is good, one is acceptable, which is permissive, and one is perfect. Now if I took an apple, put it in front of you, and I said the apple is red, tastes sweet, smells good. Are there three apples or one apple? Let's try it again. If I put an apple in front of you and I said the apple is red, it tastes sweet, smells good. Are there three apples or one apple? That's what he's saying about the will of God. The will of God is good, acceptable and... It's not saying that there are three categories to the will of God. He's saying God's will is like this. It's good for you. It is well pleasing. It's, it's fully agreeable to him. And it is perfect. It is mature. It's complete. It's a full age. It's, it's what mature people will do. That is the will of God. So just by looking at the usage of the word acceptable in the two verses, if we must be consistent um, uh, in our explanation of the word acceptable. Acceptable is not indicating to us that there is a permissive will of God or a permittable will of God. That is not what it is saying. The word acceptable means well-pleasing, fully agreeable. So first... It is simply three descriptors used to use the same thing. Secondly, the word acceptable is what it means in, in, in verse 1 as well as what it meant in Ephesians 5.17. It is well pleasing uh, and, and, and fully acceptable, fully agreeable. The third reason why we want to say that there is no uh, such thing as permissive will of God is because you don't find it anywhere else in Paul's writings. 
You don't find it anywhere else. You don't find it in Ephesians. You don't find it in Colossians. In fact, the passages we read tell us very clearly there is the will of God, period. Fourthly, why we say there is no such thing as a permissive will of God is because you don't find it in the life, ministry, and teaching of Jesus. For instance, when the sick came to him, he didn't say, well, maybe it's a permissive will of God for you to remain sick. So, next. You don't find Jesus doing that. Every person who came to him in faith, he healed. Are you understand? So there is no such thing as a permissive will of God for you to remain sick. You don't find it in the life teaching and ministry of Jesus. Now somebody may ask, what about other issues like the fall of man? And a lot of things in the Bible that you see, for instance, the Jews, the Israelites, they wanted a king. Or when they were going to the wilderness, they wanted, you know, a meat to eat in the wilderness. Uh, was it the perfect will of God? No. But did God permit it? Yes. Does it mean that was the permissible will of God? No. It meant that was not the will of God. But why did he allow it? Because they chose it. God has given each one of us a free will. So you choose. Take for instance what happens in our city. Our city has a law against murder. Murder is not allowed. Is that right? It's against the law. But do murders happen in the city? Are we living in the same city? <laughs> do murders happen in the city? So therefore do you conclude that the government has a permissive law that allows murders? No, the law still says murder not allowed. Do murders happen? Yes. Does that mean there's a permissive law that murders are allowed? No, murders are against the law. So what does the government do? The government makes every effort to fix things, to make sure, to enforce the law, to make sure that the law is followed. And those who violate the law, they put them to task. So the same way in the realm of God, there is the perfect will of God, there is the will of God, it is good, acceptable, and perfect. If you're not in the will of God, we're out of the will of God, God works to bring us back into His will. But don't call that permissive, just say, I'm out of the will of God. The reason we think permissive will is so dangerous is because many Christians think it's okay to be in the permissive will of God. And I want to state it very loud and clear here, that what some call as a permissive will of God is really out of the will of God. So might as well call it that and get back into the will of God. Enough on that. <laughs> so as we talk about uh, seeking God, our responsibility, uh, uh, we have a responsibility. We must seek, we must listen, and we must obey. So let's say this. Seek, listen, obey. Now, I don't have time to expand on this. We have it in the sermon notes available. But I'll just quickly try to summarize. When you're seeking God, there are times, you know, you're seeking God just in your everyday life. You're just praying simple prayers as you go along. We and I are making many decisions that you say, God, please help me. And then you make a decision. But seeking God can also mean that you set aside special time of seeking. Maybe you're making a major decision. So you may go over a few days or a few weeks seeking God for a certain decision. And that's a special time of seeking God. For that decision and then there of course God will speak to us in unexpected God moments he will surprise us maybe you will get a dream maybe a prophetic word will come God will speak to you that way listening we must listen attentively to the Lord it's our responsibility to listen and that's what we'll be talking about as we go along and we must obey I want to spend the rest of our time before we close in the first part of this message which is the Word of God so let's skip a few slides and go to the Word of God so the first way that we want to talk about is God leading us through His words. Two primary ways, the Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit, how God guides us. We'll read some scriptures and then I will explain how God's guidance comes to us through His Word. Psalm 119, 105. Let's read it together, please. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Verse 130 of Psalm 119, let's read it. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 37 verse 31. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. 
So all of these scriptures are telling us the importance of the word of So how does God guide us through his word? His word is a lamp that means it gives light to our path. He guides us through his word. How does he do it? Four ways. Number one is through the instructions in his words. The instructions in his word. That means God has already given us guidance about matters in life. As a husband, he told, told us, husbands, this is how you should be as a husband. As a wife, this is how you should be. Parents, this is how you should be. Children, you should be. You don't need an angel to come and tell you anything. How to be a husband. Read the instructions in his. So I'm seeking God. Should I love my wife or not? Excuse me. Go read the Bible. <laughs> He's already told you. He's already given you guidance. Husbands, love your. So there's no need to pray about that. There's no need to seek for that. You just read the Bible. The instructions are there. Follow the instructions. So every time you and I align our lives to the instruction in his word, we are following God's guidance and he will back you up 100%. If you do something just because it's in the word, he will back you up. You're following his guidance. The second way that God speaks to us through his word is what I would refer to as the quickened words. It means now that as you and I are seeking God for something that is not already explicitly stated in the word. And he's saying, God, please speak to me. He will quicken a verse. He'll make a verse come alive to you. Addressing that matter that you're praying about. So it can happen through your Bible reading time. In the morning or whenever you're reading the Bible, let's say you're praying about a decision you need to make and it's a very important decision. So you're saying, God, I really have to get this right. God, please speak to me. And you're reading the Bible and you're doing your regular Bible reading. But in your passage that you're reading that day, there's a verse that speaks to you. It's like jumps out on you. Or your eyes are open to see something you've never seen in that passage. You may have read that passage many times over. But now your eyes are open. Oh, I didn't see that. And that is speaking directly to your decision that you need to make. That is God quickening his word to you. Okay. How many of you have ever experienced that in your life? I'm sure many of us. Yeah, that's a good number. God has spoken to us already through his word in that manner. By quickening that word. Or sometimes... Uh, you may not necessarily be reading your Bible. You may just be going around your day, doing your day-to-day -day things. And suddenly, a verse comes to you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will bring to your remembrance whatever I have spoken to you. The Holy Spirit brings it to your remembrance. The verse comes. Oh. Now, that's the answer to my decision that I need to make. So it comes. So God quickens that word. He's bringing alive something in the word that is addressing your need. So that's why when you're praying about decisions, it's so important to be reading the word of God. Because you're giving God one of the many ways he can speak to you. And it's a primary way that he will speak to you, the word. Remember, we need two or three witnesses. And the word is a reliable witness. Word, very important. The third is through the word being preached. So you are maybe in a service uh, or a meeting and somebody is preaching the word of God and you've been praying saying, God, please speak to me about my situation, so on. The preacher is preaching, he is, you know, he may be preaching a message God's put in his heart, but through that message, something hits you. God is speaking to you. And the beautiful thing is, the preacher is preaching the message. There are many people in the audience who have different questions and God is answering all their questions through that one message. Preacher has no idea. Only God can do something like that. Amen? Because their questions are all very different. But through one message, God is answering the questions of different people with different needs. So through the word that is being preached, God can speak his word to you and give you an answer. 
The last one I want to just explain, elaborate a little bit because it may not be that familiar to us, which is the inner voice. The voice of our own conscience. Next Sunday we'll talk about how the Holy Spirit speaks to us on the inside and then there's the audible voice of the Spirit that we'll cover that later. But this inner voice is the voice of our own conscience. See, we are tripart beings, spirit, soul and body. Our spirit man parallels our natural man, physical man. Our physical man has faculties. We can see, hear, feel, touch, and speak, and so on. We have all those. So also your spirit man has its faculties. Your spirit man can also speak. The voice of your spirit is called the conscience. Are you understand? Now, God uses that to guide you. The voice of your spirit. I'll give you give us some scriptures and we'll explain further. Job 32 verse 8, there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. There's a spirit in you and God breathes and you get understanding. Okay God, I got it. The breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. I'll look at Psalm 51 verse 6, behold you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know Wisdom in the hidden part in your spirit, God will cause you to understand. No wisdom. Or look at Proverbs 20, verse 27. The spirit of a man is the candle of is a lamp of the Lord. What is a lamp used for? It should light our path, it's to search for things. So verse 27 says, The spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the person. So God uses the human spirit to search us and also to guide us. So your own spirit speaks. That's your conscience. Now here's a beautiful thing. Our conscience will always bear witness or speak aligned to the word it has been fed. Are you understanding that? Your conscience will always speak aligned to the word it has been. That's why you feed the word of God into your spirit. And if you are doing that and walking in the spirit, then your conscience becomes a reliable guide. Because the voice of your own spirit will always be in line with the word of? Are you understand? That's why the apostle Paul himself said, he said, I live with all good conscience before God and man. I have determined or I've sought, I've endeavored to keep a clear conscience. It's important. That you don't violate your own conscience because when you're feeding your conscience with your spirit with the word and you're praying in the spirit keeping your spirit in submission to the holy spirit then the voice of your own spirit it will be aligned to the word of god and to the holy spirit so don't violate your own conscience are you with me so far how the four ways god speaks to us through his word we're getting ready to close number one through the instructions of his word number two the quickened word number three the preached word number four the now let me share some practical examples here, life experiences here. Uh, uh, just two weeks back, I had to make a decision, an important decision. So I, uh, I just went into my room, I locked my room, I started praying in tongues. So I, I, and God knew, I said, God, I'm here specifically. I need to know what to do about this situation. Do I or do I not? I started praying in tongues. 20 minutes of praying in tongues, a verse of scripture just came up in my spirit. That was enough for me. I got my answer. So I knew God had given me the answer. I know what to do with that situation. The worst. So I just continued praying. I said, God, thank you. I've got it. So this is what I'm going to do. Based on the word. It's a quickened word. So I know what this is to make. I continued praying in tongues. But not, you know, I just wanted to spend that hour in prayer. I was going praying, then I left. But I got my answer. How? Because God quickened a word of scripture connected to that matter. And I got my answer. I remember going back in town. I'll just pick you know, uh, some examples. We, there can be so many. But this was back in Manipal when I was in college. Uh, this was 1990. And I'll share this example purposely because. Uh, uh, let me explain that later. Uh, this was I think the month of March of 1990. I was in my final year. This was my final semester in college. And I was leading the student group in Manipal. And uh, this was coming towards the end of the semester. Now, one of our, one of our uh, students, uh, he had gone to Velo 
I had attended a conference there. That conference was being run by two doctors, Drs. Mark and Betsy. They come down from the U.S. They were doing this conference. Uh, it was a very good conference. So Davis called me. He said, you know, Ashish, uh, it was a really good conference. Uh, shall we invite them to Manipal uh, for them to do the same conference in Manipal? So it's two full days plus a Sunday. Uh, now, this was getting close to the university exams. And the, uh, I'm responsible for, these, for the group of students that I'm leading. Uh, and I said, Davis, I'll get back to you. Uh, just let me know. I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. Just give me some time. So in my mind, I was processing. First, close to university exams. If they fail, they'll blame me. <laughs> we have to be studying. It takes three days. You know, plus, it costs money. You know, we had a student group to rent the hotel seminar uh, hall. We were meeting. Cost means additional two days we have to pay. We had a student group. We, that means we raise up that money to pay for that. That was the second thing on my mind. Third thing is, uh, you know, all the arrangements that need to be done. It's not just a matter of having two days. Before that, you have to inform people, you have to do all the preparations, plan everything out. Uh, all my time will go, and we are supposed to be studying for exams. So I was, all this was going in my mind, and at the end of that day, I decided, I'm going to call Davis tomorrow morning and tell him, no, he will not do it. That was my processing. The next morning, just as I, just as I'm waking up, that moment, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, flashes through my mind, very strong way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own. Understand. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. I said, God, okay. <laughs> I said, Davis, tell them to come. So I'm sharing this example because I did my processing. I did my mental thinking through. But God overrode it with a quickened word. Are you understand? He quickened. So I'm following the word. God said. Now I know that this is what's right. Because when they came, they blessed us so much. But after I left, they went back to Manipal. I think at least two other times. And God birthed a mighty move through that team that came. Uh, on, on the subsequent visits. So it was a very powerful blessing to the uh, student fellowship there. See? So God quickens that word. And he says, this is what I want you to do. But you've got to be praying. You've got to be asking God what you do. Many other decisions. You know, in, in 2013, we came to a point where I, uh, I felt, God, we should shut down APC Mangalore. Uh, the people who were leading it were leaving. Uh, uh, and the numbers had come down to just about five or six people on a weekend. And so I was like, God, should we shut down or not? And I was praying. And then God spoke to me clearly through the word. No, this must continue. So we continued APC Mangalore. And today, there are more than, like, I don't know, 60, 65 people gathering every Sunday. So God spoke to me through the word. And like this, many, many times when the word of God is, is used for God to give his guidance. He speaks to you through that word. But you've got to be listening. You've got to be open to it. Right? In closing... I want to give us a warning. Don't misuse the Bible. Don't misuse the Bible. So what do you mean misuse? It means like, oh God, speak to me. <laughs> Let's go and kill him. Okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. Don't treat the Bible like that, please. So God, I heard in church, pastor said, God speaks to me through the word. So God, what should I do? Please don't do that. Read the word of God as you would normally read and let God speak to you. The other thing is this, that, you know, we can actually use the word of God to say whatever we want it to say. We can make the Bible say whatever we want it to say. And that's a very dangerous place. I remember back in college, uh, this was 1989, uh, my third year, moving into fourth year. Uh, while I was running the student fellowship, there was this girl, and it was not Amy, <laughs> who decided that I am supposed to marry her. I don't know where she got this. But for her, every page in the Bible was telling her that I was supposed to marry her. 
So after those fellowship, I used to be scared because she would be waiting at the exit to give me the five verses she got that week <laughs> from the Bible as to why I am supposed to marry her. And I told the beginning, it's like, hey, God hasn't spoken to me nothing. I, I still haven't finished my studies. <laughs> I've got a long way to go. I'm sorry, no, no, no. But for her, it was crazy. So what was she doing? She was using the Bible to say what she wanted it to say. But here's the point. You and I can take the Bible and make it say whatever we want it to say. Nobody's going to stop you. You want to be crazy? You can be crazy. But don't do that, please. Don't do that. Okay? Stay within the word. Stay in the correct understanding. That's why you got to rightly divide the word. But the thing is this. You, you can get yourself in a huge mess by just making the scripture say what you want it to say. Don't do it. So there is a place where God will speak to us through his word, but rightly divide the word. Don't take some verse here, some verse there, and make it to mean something God never intended it to mean. Right? God will speak to us through his word, but walk in, walk carefully uh, in how you do. So we're going to continue this next Sunday as we talk about the Holy Spirit. And remember, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, so if God has spoken to you through his written word, wonderful. You say, my God, I also need some other confirmation. It's because out of two or three witnesses, every word must be established. So we will talk about the other ways God speaks to us and God guides us. Uh, thank you. Let's rise to our feet, please. We're going to pray and close. Father, I just thank you. Thank you, Father, for this time in your word. And God, we just pray for each one here. That as we journey through life, God, we will learn as your sheep to hear your voice, to know the voice of our shepherd, and to avoid the voice of a stranger. So that we can follow a shepherd correctly. I pray for each of us. Give us ears that can hear God. Give us wisdom and understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit. So that we could be filled with the knowledge of your will. That we could walk worthy of you fully pleasing to you, being fruitful in our lives in every good work and continuously, continuously increasing the knowledge of our God. Work in each of us powerfully, Father, I pray. Even those of us who are making decisions, please guide us, speak to us, by your word, by your spirit, and through the other ways that which you speak, guide us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Before we close, if there's anyone here, you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, I want to just lead you in a simple prayer this morning. If you feel inside you, I need Jesus. I need him to forgive my sins. I need him in my life. I want him in my life. But if you've never prayed and asked him to come in to your life and asked him to take charge of your life, you've never done that. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Would you please pray this prayer with me? If you feel inside you, you need to do this. And you've never done it before. We just say this with me, Lord Jesus. 
come into my life forgive my sins make me a child of God help me to follow you the rest of my life lead me into your purposes for me I pray this in Jesus name amen anyone here you pray this prayer with me for the very first time I quickly want to see your hands you prayed this with me for the very first time this morning anybody here please raise your hand so we could celebrate with you and we also want to give you a welcome a new believers back anybody I can't see up in the balcony I can't see anybody up there okay I don't see any hands but if you pray that prayer with us this morning for the first time on all our exits will be people who have a green bag or a red bag I just tell them I pray this prayer there with the green bag I pray this prayer I would like to have this back they will give it to you they also take your name and number and it'll help us be in touch with you uh, let's close we'll dismiss right after the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God our Heavenly Father and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always in Jesus name amen God bless you have a great Sunday afternoon uh, this entire sermon notes is on our website so you can download it read it again review it and uh, study it in your life groups God bless you have a good Sunday our Holy Spirit baptism will be meeting right up here so please come and be seated here uh, I'll take some time with you this afternoon God bless we trust that this message was a blessing to you we would love to hear from you you can email us at contact at apcwo.org also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources thank you for listening and god bless you